Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience and help you achieve your property goals. Welcome to our next edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. Great to have you on board again. And as we head toward the end of June, end of financial year, we're seeing lots of things uh, out there talking about tax and tax and death are two certainties in life, but you can't avoid death, but you can minimize the tax that you pay. So today where you're in for a treat, we have an expert with us who will speak about all things about depreciation, a fantastic way if you don't know about that on how to minimize your tax. So we have Tyrone Hyde, who's the CEO of Washington Brown, property tax depreciation specialist. Great to have you on board today, Tyrone. Thanks so much for inviting me, and uh, it's going to be a treat talking about depreciation. I love it, Rich. Excellent, mate. I know it's a topic <laughs> passionate and close to your heart. That's so uh, before we kick off with uh, all the tax stuff, I just have a little tradition, which is our thought of the week. And our thought of the week, I'd love your comment, comment on this week, is by John Lennon, who says, mm-hmm. life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. What do you take away mm-hmm. from that quote? Well, I think it, it, for me, it means, you know, you can just get so busy knowing life and you blink and you miss it. And I think sometimes we should all sit back and try and, I don't know, achieve something out of the norm um, and appreciate life. And for me, I did that recently where I, my family and I, we um, uh, just before COVID, we packed up um, and we moved to Bali and lived in Bali for a couple of years. And um, I let other people run the business and I just enjoyed, you know, we moved to Bali to live, uh, to take my daughter to a, Bamboo Jungle School in Ubud, um, and it was certainly, it was certainly, uh, yeah, it's an amazing school. It's full, it's just made of all bamboo. There's no aircon. There's dropped toilets. Um, it was a bit of a stepping out of, um, out of the busy life that you get into in Sydney, or I am. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, as I've got back after COVID, you kind of, you know, when you go on a holiday and you, yeah. you come back, and go, did I just have a holiday? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that's what. But also, like two years in this, in this, uh, in this heated, um, but. Uh, but bubble in, in, in Ubud um, in this jungle school. And sadly, when I come back now, it's a bit of a distant memory. But yeah. uh, I think that's what kind of means. You know, we can, we can blink and we can miss it. You know? Oh, mate, that sounds like you've done a wonderful opportunity, especially for your daughter and your family. What a, what a great yeah. opportunity. Good on you. Love oh, to fantastic. hear that, the, the learnings from that, perhaps, and on other podcasts. But uh, let's get straight into it. We're talking all sure. things tax today. Tell me for our, our listeners, what is property tax depreciation? What is it? How does it work? Sure. So just like any depreciable item, you can claim the wear and tear of an investment property against your taxable income. So when a tradie buys a ute for their business, they can claim the wear and tear of that, of that ute against the, the, the business income. You as a property investor, you can claim the wear and tear of an investment property against your taxable income. But there's one major difference, Rich. And the difference is that when you buy a, a ute for your business, it's based upon the purchase price, right? But in property, the difference is, 90% of what you claim in depreciation is based upon the construction cost. So you mm. need to work out, not the purchase price, you don't base the depreciation on what you pay for that property. You need someone to work out what it costs to build, mm. and that's where you, 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 the starting point is. I so see when you, when you buy that car from Kia, um, or a ute from Kia, you don't go out and ring Kia and go, hey, Mr. Kia, how much did it cost to build that, that ute? Um, whereas property is different. You just need someone to work out what the cost is. Mm. Um, and how, how it works in terms of, what, uh, as an investor, what it means to them, I'll give you, the, I'll, I'll break this down. If I was to, if I was on $100,000 and yep. you got a report from Washington Brown that said you can claim $10,000 in depreciation deductions, mm. yep. all along the whole way, you're paying tax for the whole year on $100,000. When you get the report, you give that to your accountant and your accountant says, well, actually, no, you've got a $10,000 deduction here. You should have been paying tax on $90,000 throughout the year and you'll get a tax refund. Mm. That's how, in summary, it works. And the good thing is, Rick, when you buy the property, it's already in there. You just need me to work out what it mm. is, that $10,000 amount is, whereas mm. all the other deductions you get, you have to physically pay for them. You have to pay for your rates. You have to pay for your levies, etc. Mm. whereas it's already in the property. So it's kind of like a free kick. 
Mm, fantastic. So that's a really good point you make just right up front. It's not mm. about what it actually, what you actually pay for it. It's about the cost replacement. And that's, that's fantastic. So mm. if you're a really savvy shopper, let's say, and you bought an oven for, you know, $750, but normally they sell for $1,000, what, what the number can you depreciate it at? That's a very good question. The, the, with, with, with the oven, with the plant equipment, it has to be based upon what you pay for it. You can't mm. go and go, oh, oh, down, down the road, I saw it for a thousand bucks. Um, right. uh, I can, I want to start it there. It has to be based upon what you pay for it. And the benefit is, that you've got the $250 discount. You can't have it. You can't double dip yeah, it. Got it. Got <laughs> even, though, even though a lot, you know, many people ask us, mm. oh, look, oh, look, I know that would have cost me $50,000 if I got a real builder in to do it <laughs> yeah. all the time, Rick, yeah, all yeah. the time. <laughs> Love it. So this sort of leads me to my next question about the accuracy. Mm. Why is it so important for tech, property investors to claim the right amount of property tax depreciation and what's the consequence of not claiming it? Well, a couple of reasons. I guess the first thing is that if you don't claim it, no one can. No one else will. So you're just missing out if you don't mm. claim those deductions. You can't. We often get some clients saying, oh, look, I bought this property and I know the previous owner didn't claim five years of depreciation. And that happens, right? And then they'll say, well, can't I, can't I get that? Can't I claim that? It happens all the time. But unfortunately, it's not. You can't do that. It's not retrospective. In terms of getting, no, it's not retrospective. But it's only from when you own the property. The, um, uh, the, in terms of getting it right, I can tell you now that the ATO constantly target this area um, more so than ever right now uh, from my 35 years of experience in this. Mm. Um, not that we're seeing audit, but there's certainly, I know they're, they're more cracking down on the repairs and maintenance mm. with, um, rather than depreciation. But the first thing that when you get audited to, um, from what I've seen, is I'll say, have you got a depreciation schedule from a quantity surveyor? If you tick, if it's a tick yes, that's a that's a good start. Right? If you tick no and you claim depreciation, that's not a good start, Rich. <laughs> mm, there you go. Fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think um, and and the consequence of not claiming it, as you say, it's just it's you've left money on money the table. Either. You've left money on yeah. the table. Like every year, it's a bit like with your super, right? You can, at the moment twenty seven and a half thousand dollars you can put into super on the concessional basis, but if you don't put it in this year, you lose that opportunity. So mm -hmm. same right. with your tax deductions. Like if you don't claim your maximum tax deduction, and you'd be crazy not to. I mean, the yeah. government honestly still doesn't know how to spend the money correctly. Um, <laughs> you're better off to really put it in your own pocket, you know? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. I couldn't agree yeah. more. Um, yeah. Tell me uh, about depreciation rates. Like you, you mm. must have, you know, I mean, tax laws are like 65 volumes long. Um, does the mm. ATO have like a list of prescribed dishwashers and ovens and prescribed rates? How, how do you work out what, to, what rate to yeah. depreciate things at? So when I started this industry, I actually was one of the founding fathers of this industry, mm. which I'm actually a fellow of the AIQS, which, are, awesome. so, which is an FAIQS, but these days I think the F stands for freaking old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when I, when, when I first started this, there was no, there was no um, actual list of what you can and can't claim. So after about five years of other quantity surveyors doing this, we all have different versions of what you can claim, what you can't claim, what is a kitchen a, is a kitchen a removable item or is it fixed to the building? And the ATO saw all these different quantity surveying reports with all different um, uh, items that we can and can't claim, and they came up with a definitive list. It was a fair while ago now, but it was about 15 years ago. So we all are working on the same uh, list of what we can and can't claim. Yeah. In terms of rates, yes, the ATO has given us a whole list of, you know, this um, ovens will depreciate over 10 years and carpets over eight years, et cetera, bricks over 40 years. So there's a whole list of what you can and can't do. Now, what you, what we're talking about is just the residential depreciation numbers, right? But the, 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 the volumes are huge. It goes into every category of every industry, manufacturing, you know, there's pig farming separate. You can, you know, wow. down, to, down, down to how much you can depreciate a garden gnome. I think oh, you not. Wow. <laughs> right, so it is very detailed of what you can and can't claim. Yeah. Um, so they, we are kind of governed in that regard. So that's an interesting point because it's like people just say, "Oh, look, my accountant will work it out." Honestly, mm -hmm. this, that's just going to a fallacy. Look, no, no disrespect to accountants; they're great, but they need your report. I mean, I've always used a, a depreciation schedule uh, like for, from yourselves and found it fantastic. But uh, you've got to get it right because the ATO, as you say, is cracking down, uh, particularly around the difference between repairs. And replacement. Um, that's a real, and capital improvements. That's a very important uh, mm -hmm. mistake that people make. But uh, tell me, what what sort of tracks the highest rates of depreciation? Is it the is it the dishwashers or is it the carpets? Yeah. What what things really wear out the fastest? 
just just before I go into that, the um just on the accounting issue. So mm. accounts aren't actually allowed to estimate construction costs where the costs are unknown. They they can't do depreciation of the building. There is a ruling that says coin surveyors are the the go to people for that. Okay. Turn, yeah, yeah, which is a wonderful ruling. It happened in 1997. Um, and I'd, I wrote my thesis on this topic in 1994, yeah. and I like when this ruling came out, I went woohoo! <laughs> yeah, validated validated yeah. your you're ahead you're of your futurist, ahead of the curve. Yeah, well, I was, I was <laughs> um, in terms of what depreciates faster, the things that are easily removable, um, like so the ovens, dishwashers, but even more so like light fittings and blinds. It, it makes sense. Things that are going to wear and tear quicker, that you've got to replace quicker, are the things that depreciate faster. Got things it. that are going to last longer. Like bricks, concrete, tiling, yeah. roofing. That's that's that that's the slow forty year um, depreciation rate on those things. But yeah, yeah, okay. that's how it works. Yeah. Mm. So you mentioned there's been different rulings over time. Like, do you think the government? Uh, also, tell me what's firstly changed mm. with depreciation mm. deductions over the last five years. Mm. I remember you woke up one morning not long ago and freaked out when there was a change. Tell us about that. <laughs> I still uh, still can't sleep, Rich. I've got to be honest with you. Uh, well, th- th- this was in actually it was in not, it was in 2017, May something mm. 2017. Uh, embedded in my head. So the, we it was budget night, and um, no one saw this coming. And and the government uh, budget night said, as of seven o'clock tonight, no property investor can claim depreciation on things like ovens, dishwashers, etc. If they're second hand, you can in residential property. Mm. You can only claim those if you buy it brand new which in my view was a bit silly, and I, the Treasury Department invited me in to discuss it with them, mm. and they really were just doing, you know, the um, con- industry consultation. They were never going to change the their token, mind. The token consultation. Yeah, token, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah we, we approached the industry. Mm. They, they already made the decision, right? Mm. Um, so it is a major difference now be, between buying, in depreciation terms, be buying a property that's brand new versus a one-day-old one, which is crazy because the government also says carpet's going to last 10 years, for instance, but... If I buy a property that's one day old, it's only it's lasted one year in terms of the depreciation value. So it kind of favours new properties, which I don't know if it's a good thing. Um, but and they didn't. Ch- and the other bizarre thing, they didn't change it for residential. I'm oh, sorry, for, they didn't change it for commercial industrial. So we re- we co- we can still revalue a uh, hundred year old commercial properties, right? Oh, yeah. Which is crazy. Mm. So to put this in perspective, if I was to buy a brand new property today for a million bucks, mm. I would ex- the the and I bought it for a million bucks and as an investment property, I'd be able to claim about $25,000 in depreciation deductions. Mm. If I sold that to you, Rich, tomorrow for, mm. for, uh, one, one day later, so it's only one day old, mm. you'd only be able to claim about $8,000. There you go. Big difference. Mm, huge. It's a big difference. So, mm, but I, I'm not telling people to, they have to base their investment decisions on what the depreciation numbers are. I'm just telling you, this is what's happened. And not, mm. not still today, we serve our, our clients and still, I'd say 90% of people still don't know, which mm. is... um Interesting. So, yeah, it's a very yeah. confusing topic, and that's why we're talking about it today. Mm. But really, mm. I appreciate you taking the time to help educate our no, audience. I love it. And, and, and tell me more about the, the whole mm. government angle on it. Do you think the government mm. is likely to continue to tweak and, and change uh, depreciation rates in the future? Like, do you think they'll just remove it completely for second-hand property, for example? You know, or, or could change do. it? Yeah. Could do. Mm. I, I, they could do. I, I think... Um, yeah, look, uh, it, look, the, the depreciation is a tool the government can lever to promote activity in different industries. How this actually started back in 1979 was they um, uh, wanted more hotels built. So mm. hotels, for instance, get a 4% building allowance, which mm. means they, the hotels are saying that the structure only lasts for 25 years, even though it's the same bricks. Mm. But it is a tool that the government can lever depending upon where they want more activity. Mm. Um, so, yes, they, and I think they could... I think they could cancel the building allowance on second-hand properties, which, you know, if they do, they do. But mm. what I think they could do even further, they could increase it more on new property. Because at the moment, as you know, there's not enough new property being built. Exactly. The... That was going to be my next uh, question in a way. Yeah, is like, yeah. is this, mm. it, could this be a policy tool to increase supply? Absolutely. Yeah, and it could Absolutely. well be. Because, yeah. because what they could do, because as you know, to get f- developments off the ground, you need pre-sales, right? Mm. And a lot of people with, with the mascot towers and all these yeah. disasters, not a lot yeah. of people are rushing in to buy new property, right? Oh, off, the the plans, that, off the off the plans, plans. On, on the nose, isn't it? On the nose, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the only ways that they used to be able, you could sell new property is based upon it being cash flow positive because of all these depreciation deductions. Mm. So they could increase the building allowance to 4% as opposed to 2.5% yeah. to make it even look more attractive. Mm. And the reason they could do that it's because when you claim the building allowance, you have to factor it back into the um, capital gains tax equation 
anyway. So they're mm-hmm. going, they're quite to get it back anyway. So it wouldn't be a lot of skin off their nose, but I don't think, um, yeah, so they, they certainly could do that. Okay. Do that. Yeah. Let's just talk again about secondhand property because there's still a mm-hmm. lot of confusion, even though there's been that mm-hmm. amendment about, uh, not being able to claim, uh, the, the fittings yep. and fixtures on, on older properties. Yes. But my understanding is that you still can if there's been yep. a renovation, right? So tell us about what depreciation is available on established or secondhand properties. We really appreciate you tuning in to the Property Buyer Podcast and I hope that you're finding our expert interviews helpful. So that we can keep providing this information and growing our audience, we rely on word of mouth recommendations. If you found this information useful, could I please ask you to share this podcast with your friends, family and colleagues and ask them to subscribe to the Property Buyer Podcast. It would be a big help and we'd be very grateful for your support. Thanks once again for sharing the links And now, let's get back to the podcast. So, any property built after 1987, you can still today claim the structure of the building. And let's put this in perspective. The structure of the building, the structure is the brickwork, concrete, not the ovens and dishwashers, that stuff. It's the the roof, et cetera. And that represents about 90% of the claim. So, it's only the 10% that's been adjusted, that's been removed for secondhand property. Mm. The problem is that that 10%, it's the stuff that depreciates quicker and that incre- it, 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 it makes your cash flow better because you get a higher depreciation in those early years, mm. right? That's the difference. So, you, But you can still definitely claim building allowance, structure, and it's still worthwhile. Mm. It's just not as much as it used to be. Mm. If you buy a secondhand property and you renovate it yourself, yes, you can claim whatever is, is – even though it might be a 100-year-old Paddington Terrace, if you buy a brand-new oven from Harvey Norman and put it into your brand-new terrace – you can still claim that. So mm. even though the property structure is secondhand, mm. you can still claim the depreciation if you buy the stuff yourself. Got and it. if someone has done a rent, if I, if I also buy another, another example, if I was to buy a 1900 Paddington Terrace and the, the, the um, previous owner did a renovation five years ago, mm. right? That went and they spent say half a million bucks or $250,000, whatever it is mm. on that renovation, we would go out and go, Oh yes, we think that re- renovation happened five years ago. And that client spent about $250,000 or that, that vendor spent $250,000 and you will start the depreciation from when you settle based upon our estimate of five years ago of what that person, um, spent on that renovation. Mm, okay. So just, just on that renovation stuff. So how do you estimate mm. that? Is there something you can look up or do you kind mm. of just get a microscope or, you know, some <laughs> carbon dating testing? Like how do you, yeah. do you, how forensically do you get in terms of when you don't know that a property, the date yeah. that's been renovated, how do you actually go out there and do that? So when you graduate, you get a magic wand. It is a, one of the hardest things we can do yeah. because, um, Especially if it's just an internal renovation, mm. right? If it's a major renovation, there'll be council documentation, etc. Mm. But internal renovations where you don't have to go to council, mm. it, it can be, it is really, and, and there's been no information transposed over from the vendor. Mm. It really is our own skill set of working those right. things out, looking at, mm. you know, of our hundreds of thousands of inspections, looking at what, you know, maybe it might be the type of tiling used, what was yes. in trend at that time, that right. type of thing, right? Yeah, right. Um, but it is, but it, it is not a, it is not a precise science, and that's why the ATO accepts our estimate. Um, right. on so that. it might be the make and model of the oven or, you know, yeah, so exactly. or, or the paisley tiles or something like yes. that. Yeah, right. Yes, okay. exactly. Got but it. It, is, it can be tricky, definitely. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, um, look, we're, we're recording this just sort of toward the end of the financial year in June, and yeah. uh, it's, it's everything, everyone's talking about tax. Everyone starts looking yeah. at their pay slips going, gosh, look, I'm paying so much tax, and um, but what are some of the common tax mistakes that you see property investors making in their claims or that you hear about? Sure. So I guess the first thing is not getting depreciation schedule. That would be uh, something you could do. But of the, the, at the moment, um, well, firstly, it would be not knowing the new law. So we, when we're speaking to property investors, they still think they can claim all the depreciation on the second M items. But in terms of what the ATO is targeting this year, I can guarantee you they are targeting repairs and maintenance. It is, mm-hmm. and I can. Two of my staff members, this is so, it's not just anecdotal, two of my staff members have been ordered this, this is, since, yeah. since the ATO put out a press release saying yeah. Yeah. We have, we're targeting repairs and maintenance. Yeah. They've both been audited mm. for claiming repairs and mm. they did that, they, they did their own report. So I'm yeah. pretty sure they're right, Perfect. but they are targeting, they are Excellent. targeting. Yeah. And the, one of the, one of the major things that people need to understand about repairs is if it's called initial repairs, there's a thing called initial repairs and 
if I was to buy an old property and it looked like, you know, the bathroom tiling, I don't know, something was leaking, maybe the, 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 the bath was leaking and I replaced the bath, um, et cetera, right? Because I bought it, brand, because I just bought it, um, it is not a repair to that bath. It is an initial repair, which means it has to be over a 40 year period. However, if I, if I, if, if I had that property for three years and the same issue happened and I fixed it, that would be a repair. So the government says, that because you didn't own it and the wear and tear or the damage didn't occur when you owned it, mm. right, you can't claim it as a repair. Mm. That's the difference. Whereas um, if you get out a – if I okay, I'll give you another example. Say I bought a house today and the hot water system um, was, was, was in need of um, the maintenance. So I got a plumber out, yep. right? On day one, he fixes the hot water system. It's not a repair, even though you might have been 200 bucks. But if I did the same thing again six months later, it'd be a repair. Mm. So that's what people need to be considered mm. uh, considerate of. They they certainly cracking down on that. Excellent. No, really good, really good advice there. Um, tell us about old versus new property investment. When you're buying a new investment, or when you're buying an, an investment property, how much importance do you think an investor should place on depreciation? Do you think that depreciation should, should be a deciding factor, or is it like a nice to have, the icing on on the top of the cake sort of thing? We well, probably ask the wrong person, but um, <laughs> look, if, if, if I'm honest, it shouldn't be a factor. I don't think it should be a factor, Rich. I think I think there's many other factors that I would consider before I was to buy an investment property. Depreciation wouldn't wouldn't be uh, top of the list. Wow, I that's a, the I've other... got to say, I've got to compliment you on that answer because you run a mm. depreciation cap, company and yep. you say mm. it's it's not the most important factor. And I I totally agree. No, we're near it. Yeah, tell no, me. Near what, tell, no, unpa- no, unpack it for me. Let's unpack it for our okay. listeners. Why is that? Do you think? Um, because I think there's many other, look, for SARS, I, I, I don't think it's actually a huge factor for a lot of people buying secondhand properties either. Mm. I think it is a factor for people buying new properties, but there's many other factors that should be, um, considered in buying an investment property, like the, what is the land content to the purchase price, mm. um, with the location, so where it is. I could think of 50 things I would think about before I bought a, uh, before I was worrying about what the mm. depreciation numbers are, to be mm. honest. Um, even though that's my business, right? But once you've got it, what I'm saying is once you've bought that property, then you need to get a report yep. to help your cash flow. Mm. But don't make your decisions whatsoever based upon what the depreciation numbers are. It mm. really is an icing on the cake thing, mm. right? Um, so, and I'd also be wary. I had one client ring me up once and she said to me, she said, Ty, I've been to eight different building sites because we give a lot of reports to developers to sell properties, right? So we say, okay, if you buy this million dollar property, Mr. Investor, you'll get year one, $25,000 deduction, yep. year two, 20,000. And then, and, and, and we do that for all, a lot of big developers. And so this one client rang me up once. He said, Tyron, I've, bought, I've been to eight different building sites. Um, and I saw the, all your reports on everyone. She goes, I've got them all here. And this, this particular development site says you can get $25,000 in year one, which is more than all the others. She goes, so that makes that one the best investment, doesn't it? I said, no. <laughs> no. I swear, I swear. That's what, I was like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. No, no, it's just a number. Don't think of it like yeah. There's many other factors you need to consider. Good on you. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's, this is the point exactly that I'm pleased you made it is that it gets the tax depreciation on you is blown out of proportion. I mean, I remember, uh, back in the day, you know, the Sprukers on the Gold Coast would be flying mm. people up. And the first thing they would talk about is the massive tax depreciation. Mm, you know? mm, and look, saving mm. tax is a great thing by buying property investment. Anyone that's earning a decent income should be buying properties and reducing yep. their tax legally, uh, using all the incentives there. Uh, but the problem is it gets blown out of proportion. And I think that's the mm. key point that our, our listeners need to take away from this. Mm. A lot of the times over my life, sadly, I've, when I've, we do a lot of work with sometimes, or we try to avoid them sometimes, but a lot of these people selling these house and land packages in mm not the nicest areas, um, and we see 10 years later that it's the same value as what it was 10 years mm. ten years ago, yeah. right? And yeah. it's part of it is based upon this selling of, um, you know, the, the big depreciation numbers. Like sometimes they call it even a, you know, a government incentivized program. It's, no, it's not. I don't know. It's like, no, it's, not. it's just depreciation. And, um, yeah. yeah. See, anyway. that, that's a really good point. See, I mean, someone who's bought – a house and land package out at, you know, past, you know, the Ripley Valley, you know, out the west, out past Ipswich, for example, on a 300 mm. square metre block of land. And they paid back in the day 400 grand and it might be worth 450 today. Sure, they've made, you know, nice little tax deduction, but they've made very, very minimal capital growth. You know, mm. you're far better off to buy 
uh, secondhand established properties. I mean, in fact, Tyrone, ninety nine percent of what we buy for our clients is established properties um, because yeah. we believe that the land content and the location is critical in in getting the right sort of capital growth for our clients. So, but uh, tell me one, a little bit about one, your sorry, one, one thing. Right, to be honest, yeah. One thing I've noticed on that, I actually think it could because. Because when we do all our reports, we analyze, we see, we look at all the past sales history of every product. We've done 300,000 reports, which so we see, wow. we look at a lot of data. Mm. And one thing I've noticed is that when, if, if it could be a strategy to follow the lands, the house of Lance Brooker, right? Because mm. what happens is after about 10 years, it's still flatline. But, mm. and that's when these people are tearing in the hair, hair out they, mm. and they throw everything into the bigger. I've got to sell this property, right? Mm. But what I've noticed is at about that 10 year period, that's when it starts to actually get some growth. Exactly. Right? So exactly. you could actually, what you could do is follow some of the spruikers that yeah. are on uh, all the right and, and just wait and put them down where they're buying now. Yeah. Go there in 10 years' time and buy. <laughs> well, <laughs> to be to be actually honest, that's exactly what we've done in some of our cases. We've done very well. Go. We've found the stress, <laughs> stressed out investors and we've bought very well just before it's gone yeah. up, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other good thing about that is the 10-year period, that's when I actually, if I was to advise someone, someone said, time, what would be your kind of go-to property? I would actually say about a 10 year old property. And the reason is that you can get great sales data and actually know what the value is. Whereas mm-hmm. if it's brand new, it's really hard to, it's just what the developer can put on a, on a block of a par. This is what I think yeah. I can get, right? Yeah. Whereas a 10 year, 10 year, you get great sales history and actually go, well, this is what it's actually worth. And the other thing is for me, the, the, the ideal kind of property is something that I can spend 20 to 50 K doing up, right? Mm-hmm. Do it myself, no risk. I don't have to get a builder involved. It might yeah. go broke. It's not too big. Yeah. And it's a bit of a makeover. Mm. And then all that stuff is highly depreciable as well. Yeah, so, yeah. because, so, and yeah, you know, you're putting in a new oven, new carpets and making it. I think that's the biggest bang for your buck you can get is that 10 yeah. year old property. Love it. Love it. Fantastic. Mm. So tell mm. me uh, a bit about your personal investment strategy and philosophies. Mm. Are you an active investor and, and what sort of motivated you to get started with property investing? Well, I certainly, I certainly have been an active investor. I, um, I was just looking at this the other day. I've bought 22 properties in my life. Um, don't have more now, but, um, but in terms of what motivated me, well, I, um, my, I saw my father lose all his money. Mm. You know, wow. failed property deal in 1987. He, my father was the smartest man I've ever known. He had four degrees. He was in the Air Force for 12 years and then he became a lecturer, um, in psychology. And, and when I was, when he was about 50, Five, he had a stroke, which is about my age, which wow. is why I'm on the blood pressure tablets. Um, and he, and he had paralyzed. So most, he had paralyzed on the left hand side completely, wow. um, for most of my life. So for the last 20, so when I was 13, he had the stroke. And so for 17 years, he was completely paralyzed, crippled. And, you know, he used to get, a, he used to make me get a pin and prick his arms to see whether he could feel it and stuff wow. like that. And anyway, so they retired him early. Um, and he got a payout of $250,000 in 1987. Mm. And, Invested it all in one company, oh, no. State Mortgage, and oh, um, no. mm. and then the interest rates went up to seventeen percent, and they were advertising themselves as bricks safe as bricks and houses. We're investing in property. They were, but what they were doing was putting into mezzanine finance, yeah. right? Mm. And so when interest rates went up to seventeen mm. percent, that all fell over like a half deck of cards, mm. and he lost pretty much everything. So the mm. stroke didn't kill him. Mm. Um, seeing him lose all his money, mm. and you know, I think he ended up with like seven cents in the dollar. Mm. Uh, that's what killed him. That kind of motivated me to get into property and educate people and hopefully, you know, uh, mm. save people a few bucks. Mm. Um, so that's what kind of motivated me to get into this um, property market. Excellent, yeah. yeah. And do you have a particular uh, strategy that you use yourself? Do you buy brand new? Do you buy established? Do you do developments? What, what sort of strategies do you I've, use yourself? I've, well, th- to be honest, it's, it's changed over the years. Because I, I started with nothing, when I fir- my first strategy was to get into it all cost, right? <laughs> because I was, I was um, in actual fact, my first property deal was the best deal I ever did. I was, uh, because I was working, with, I, I, when I first started in the quantity surveying industry, it wasn't in depreciation. We, I was a traditional quantity surveyor, which means that we would work for the bank as a consultant, as a project auditor. And so when you borrow, if you borrow $10 million from a bank to do a development, the bank just doesn't give you 10 million bucks. They'll say, okay, how much is it going to cost to build? They'll get an independent estimate from someone like me. Yeah. And then we will go out every month and do a progress plan. Um, and, uh, and certify, you know, you've done a million bucks worth of work that will pay the developer, pay the builder, hopefully the subcontractors if everything goes well. And I was working on, I was doing that on one of these projects and, um, and, and I, I, I put like $1,000 down on this, on this unit. Uh, and because of the, the build went broke and I helped the, um, the developer project manager out to the completion. 
Um, and by the time it finished, it had gone up like a hundred grand, yeah. right? And I put one thousand down. <laughs> so when I sold it, I turned that one thousand bucks into a hundred thousand dollars, which was mm. great. And I was, I, I did that with a partner as well yeah. at the time. Yeah. And so the first three properties I bought were all in JV, not JVs, but just, you know, like, hey, hey, my brother, my, my mm. girlfriend at the time, let's buy mm. a property together, pull our three percents together because we don't know if it's had any money. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and just got into the market that way. Mm. And I guess over time, What's happened is it's evolved. I've gone from here there to, you know, a bigger place. And so I haven't really like, oh, this is my strategy. It's mm. really more about what, um, mm. what, what I, what I can get the bigger and the, the, yeah. the, the nicer, the shinier, but I don't yeah. go, oh, I want to buy a new property, but also even like commercial properties. So I've bought commercial properties for my office. It's been more about what I needed. Yes. And as time's moved on, I've sold some of those properties and now I've just reduced my debt to like, I've got, I think 2% gearing on my portfolio. There. So, wow. well, which yeah. is, I guess, um, yeah, which I guess, is look, I'm not the model for going out and you know going out and getting a lot of debt. I guess as as you move on in life, you you kind of I sleep put it this way, Rich, I sleep a lot better. Yes, well, than having a lot of debt. That's than that's a, really uh, good. I mean, that, that's for everyone to decide on. There's their own level of yeah. leverage and level of risk, and so good on you. So yeah, yeah, that, that's great. Yeah. Um, and just a little bit more about investing. Do you have a particular uh, method of deciding where to invest? Do you choose any particular yep. locations based on any sort of criteria yourself? Yep, yep. So we are looking at the moment, but we've just because I'm doing my own podcast, I've been speaking to a lot of people, and um, uh, I've, I've, what I would do at the moment, I would, I tend to do all my investing, whether it be shares, or everything. I tend to do the complete opposite of what everyone is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the moment. I would be running from Perth myself because my Facebook feed is just full of <laughs> Perth, 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 right? And, and some of the people doing Perth, 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 uh, I, I worry about. Um, so I would be looking for myself. I've, we're going to start looking in Melbourne because I like the fact that uh, no one's liking Melbourne at the moment. I like the fact that the, I like the I like the fact that the gap between mm. Sydney and Melbourne has never been greater. Mm. I, I like I think that the the fact that at any time the government could change. The stupid land tax laws they've got there will put a rocket up it, and I'd rather buy before they put the rocket up it mm. rather than after. So if anywhere, I personally, I'd be looking, I'd be looking in Melbourne at the moment, mm. um, um, in blue chip. But uh, yeah, so that's what Excellent. what I'd be doing in terms of that. No, yeah. I've talked with quite a few people about that, and we, you know, again for look, I think Perth does have maybe a couple of years left to run, um, but I think it'll definitely run out of steam. I mean. Uh, a market that's gone 20% per annum mm. is not sustainable. And I think you mm. always look at the, the differential between the capital cities. And um, Melbourne has just been completely lacklustre in performance, you know, like one or, I think it was two or 3% last year and, you know, two or 3% the year after. It's got a COVID, a COVID hangover, basically. And yeah, uh, yeah. unfortunately, the government's in a lot of debt. But uh, I totally agree with you. And we're putting the, a lot, the, the of, our, that... we're putting a lot yeah, of our yeah. strategic investors into Melbourne that have got the yeah. ability to buy properties that aren't perhaps as, as highly cash flowed. Um, you can, I mean, you can still buy, you know, we, we, I mean, we bought a unit the other day uh, and we got a yield of 5%, you know, 5.5%, wow. which is pretty decent. But, you know, if yeah. you're buying houses, you're going to get sort of 3 maybe 4%. Uh, but we're doing a strategy ourselves in Melbourne at the moment where we're buying houses and adding granny flats and because uh, mm. they've changed the legislation. But I agree overall. Um, yeah, I'd agree. Melbourne's a great pick at the moment. So, yeah. The, the funny thing about the, the, not the funny thing, but the sad thing is when you see something like Perth, what happens is you see a bit of growth, right? We've seen it for, you know, Perth was dormant for what, 14 years? And now it's like, oh, it's like, it just, it's only like Perth disappeared on the map in Australia, right? It's a bit bizarre. But what happens is the spruikers see this growth and this momentum, right? Mm. And then they start going, Perth, you know, I've got three spots in Perth and, 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 and they're, and people are going to go there because it's easier, right? Mm. They just start rely on someone to mm. do this house and land package over in Perth. Mm. And, and so the spruikers come in at this type of, the, mm. at, at this time of, of, of the mm. cycle in, mm. in that city and go, yes, I've got Perth bucket. And everyone thinks everywhere in Perth is going to go up. There will be good areas in Perth. Don't get me wrong. Mm. But unfortunately, there's going to be some people that are going to be hurt in Perth right yeah. now. I can tell you that yeah. much. That's it. Yeah. Um, and talking about property types to invest in, do you have a particular view on what would be a, a good property type? I mean, is it apartments? Is it townhouses, terraces, houses? Do you apply any particular criteria for choosing properties sure. yourself? I would look, I think you've got to have higher land content. Even though I'm all about depreciation, you really need a high land to purchase price rate, uh, ratio. For me personally, I also look, which I'm not, a lot of your listeners aren't going to be able to do, but I look at the replacement costs or the, what it would cost to build or replace that property as well, right? Mm. Um, so for instance, the house I'm living in now, I bought, I don't want to use the numbers, but I bought, I bought a property and I, I could tell the difference between what the land value was from the council, mm. right? And what I was paying 
and it was only a six month old property. I'm like, hmm, there's there's something wrong here. This is good because uh, I knew the build costs on this property would be like four million bucks, five million bucks, right? Yeah. But it wasn't there the differential. So I factor into, and it, it's come true because it's already gone bananas because mm. I just knew that because also because construction costs have gone through the roof as well. So then the replacement costs now would be even further. Mm. Yes. So I factored that into the component, but I know a lot of your listeners are. So for your listeners, I would be looking really at a high land uh, land uh, ratio as you can in a good area. But because I don't subscribe to the myth that they're not making, buy probably they're not making more, any more land, right? Mm. That's not mm. completely true because mm. what people do is they buy farms and they chop them up and they subdivide, right? Mm. They are making more land. So you can't just think that I buy property anywhere and it's going to mm. go up. It exactly. doesn't work like that. You've got, to, you've got to buy good land in good areas. It's all about proximity, all about proximity. Yep. And, I agree. Uh, and just finally on your investment strategies, have they evolved over time? I think you've sort of touched on it a bit before. Yeah. You've bought commercial property, you've kind of evolved. Yep. I mean, because I think a lot of investors get a bit impatient. You know, they listen to so many podcasts like this and they read the media and, you know, when they get to age 30, they think they should have 13 properties in their portfolio. And I think, mm. you know, for me, I just say to people, just be patient. You know, if you invest in property, Property investing will do the heavy lifting for you, but don't run ahead of where you are. You know, you've got to learn to crawl before you walk, before you run. Um, mm-hmm. How how does that sort of philosophy work for you in your own life? Well, I guess as I've doubled down, I've, I've as I said, I've reduced uh, my debt and put it into the to the few. I'd rather I'd rather a few good bigger ones than mm-hmm. than I couldn't think of anything worse than having a hundred one bedroom apartments in Cairns. <laughs> oh, sorry, there are things worse. But the paperwork and like, oh. why, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you rather, if you had a hundred, hundred properties in cans, right, or wherever it is, um, of little things that have all those, there's a lot of, there's a, there is a lot of great work in running sometimes, probably all the, mm. not a lot of work, but there's, you know, there, there is, there's a lot of counting sometimes to do with that. And mm. if you had a hundred little individual properties, you're going to, um, have a lot of expenses as a ratio mm. rather mm. than having one, Five million dollar um, uh, commercial complex that's got ten different tenants, yeah. um, you know, and and th- that's a risk in itself. Mm. Rather than having all this, all these little ones that sometimes might take a little bit longer to sell because yeah. they're not in the best areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. No, cool. Really good points. Really good points. Um, back to tax depreciation. What, what would it cost yeah, the average investor <laughs> to prepare a depreciation report? What, and I mean, I guess what do you charge? And and yep. would you recommend that a QS uh, preparer a schedule or, or just get the accountant to do it? Well, it depends on the the property, obviously, and the, the type. But what we also need to consider here is that when the laws changed in 2017, when we're really claiming under the structure, not every property now needs to be inspected in order mm-hmm. to get the maximum depreciation. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, we do a lot of work with developers and we've got a lot of the costs already. So mm-hmm. we pass that saving on to the client. So roughly you can pay... For a residential property, you should be paying somewhere between 400 to 770 for a mm-hmm. property. And that would depend upon the type of property, where it is, how big it is. Sometimes we offer, we, we, it's, the industry's gone a bit funny in some ways where a lot of firms just offer a fixed price for the one, for well, all type of property, which I kind of find bizarre because if I bought a five bedroom house in Vaucluse, um, as an investment property, and people do trust me, as opposed to a one bedroom studio apartment in the city, it's going to take a lot more time to work out the, the, the cost and give you the best report for that foreclosed property mm. as opposed to a little one bedroom thing. So we, we, we look at every individual property and price it accordingly to the volume of work that involves. And, um, and, and sometimes we offer a premium service where someone like, I'll even go to that property myself. I did an inspection yesterday, Rich, and I was, um, because the client, the property deserved it because when everyone's just given this flat rate, they're sending out sometimes just kids, you know, like mm-hmm. to take a couple of photos. So I'm lifting the lid on the industry there, but I think we should be looking at each property individually mm-hmm. and um, make a decision upon that property Excellent. as in terms of how much yeah. we price it. Yeah, perfect. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, 700 bucks for a report when you're getting, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of dollars back in just in one year as a tax deduction, yep. is a, it's a no-brainer. So the, the metrics, the ROI was... And it's tax deductible it's, it's as well. Yep, there tax you go. deductible. There you go. There you go. But we also we also say we we don't get you twice our fee in the first year. We don't charge the client anyway, so yeah. you still get a report. But we don't. Perfect, we're in charge. perfect guarantee. Now, yeah. uh, just to finish up, you, you've made an amazing yeah. business, Tyron. Uh, out of uh, you've been doing it for forty years, and I, I think you wrote a book with a, a great two word title called Claim It. Uh, love yep. that. Love your your brevity <laughs> in that title. Um, how, how have you done it? How have you built your business? And out of a topic that people find you know quite difficult to, or boring to talk about. <laughs> Well, I, I, it's funny. Well, firstly, I had to rewrite that book 
Because when the laws changed, um, Rich, I had to rewrite it because all the, it was all, yeah. half of it was incorrect anymore. So yeah. I, and I rewrote it and I called it Keep Claiming It. Keep Claiming um, It. <laughs> keep Claiming It. <laughs> That's a free word title, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was actually, both, both of them my wife came up with. She's a, she is a writer. So yeah. uh, she's quite yeah. clever. How, yeah. how have I, how have I done it? Um, yeah. You know, I just, I just love saving people money. I actually yeah. find it really interesting. Yeah. I, I love, when I first started this, I would sit up all night and just read tax laws, tax laws, tax wow. laws. And I've had some pretty, and just so I can pass on that information to, yeah. to my investor database. And what's happened, I, I, Harry Triboff was, is one of my clients who, I don't know if people know, they probably know who he is. He's Australia's yeah. second richest person. He owns Meriton and he's always tested me. He's always tested me. And, and um, and like, um, and so doing his big projects and he's mm. not depreciation schedule, there's depreciation schedules and then there's depreciation schedules. There's, yeah. there's a, you know, the standard one his, bedroom his, his unit that you steroids, do. His I'd imagine. Yeah. His, his yeah. Steroid, and they're complicated. Like when he bought mm. World Tower, he bought that site with four different buildings in there, right? With mm. three different builders who've gone broke. Yeah. How do you work out those things? So it's not wow. always that simple, right? Mm. And so there, and for me, that getting, getting my, teeth into those kind of complex Fantastic. projects mm. is uh really interesting like we do some pretty interesting stuff mm. um so yeah I, I love it i guess my hopefully my enthusiasm for this um i did a podcast the other night i did a live podcast the other night and i think the general comments were Andy Tyron, how can you be so enthusiastic about this, this topic great, like, well, it's wonderful. <laughs> i mean it comes through your your passion your intellect for it the fact you did your thesis on it mate it's in your blood yeah. so well done it's it's wonderful. Wonderful. So, a bit weird isn't it though i love it mate <laughs> So final question I'd love you yeah. to share with our audience. Can yeah. you tell yeah. us maybe the best piece of investment advice you've ever received? Oh, I'm glad you asked this question. All right. So I, as I said, I, I, my, my, one of my clients is Harry Triggeroff and yeah. he's, um, he's worth $27 billion, $26 billion now. Yeah. He owns Meriton. So to put that in perspective, if you were to merge Suncorp Bank, which owns Vero, Amy, API, all those insurance companies, with AMP mm. and you merge them together, you still haven't reached his personal net wealth, right? Wow. <laughs> so when he invites me for, he made, he made $1.4 billion over the last, per hour over the last four years. So when he invites me for lunch, <laughs> when he invites me to lunch, I'm scared. Yeah. He's going to send me an invoice for two hours, right? Yeah. When I get back to the office. <laughs> uh, but he said to me at one lunch, he said to me, he said, Tyron, and, and when Harry talks, yeah. he ends his sentences with a higher intonation at the end. Right. Tyron! He said, Tyron. Do you want to know, do you want to know the secret to my success? Now, Rich, I'm not going to say no. Yes, Harry. Yeah. Of course. Harry, yes, what is the secret to your success? He said, listen to me. He said, Tom, when times are bad, I buy land. By the time I get development approval, times are good again. Hmm. I'll say that again. When times are bad, I buy land. By the time I get development approval, which would be two to three years in his case, times are good again. Mm. Now, what does that mean? Mm. That means ignore the noise. Mm. Back yourself. You know, yeah. good times will follow, bad times will follow, good times. Mm. You see, for someone like Harry, who not only um, who buys the land, then develops it, and then keeps half the stock himself, it's not a question of whether you time the market or have time in the market. For someone like Harry, he does both. He times the market and then has time in the market. Mm. And if you can do that, Rich, think you found the holy grail mate love that piece of advice that is so wonderful and that's very timely at the moment because we're finding a lot of people are hesitating on pulling the trigger on buying we're talking to a yeah. lot of people you know neighbors and family members all with good intentions saying oh look i think you should just wait till interest rates drop but yeah. i can tell yeah. you the minute we get one rate cut or two rate cuts guess yeah. what's going to happen the absolutely. market is going to absolutely re-accelerate and instead of trying to buy a property when two or three people are bidding against you, you're going to have 10 or maybe 15 people at the auction, you know? Yep, so yep. just like Harry's advice, you know, ride out the cycles. I think that's a wonderful yep. piece of advice. Fantastic. Mate. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that. Well, mate, that comes you. to thank the end of our podcast, mate. Been lovely to have you on. Great. Uh, and if people want to get in touch with you, uh, tell us your website. Uh, www.washingtonbrown.com.au. <laughs> Fantastic. And look, um, you've written a, a bunch of stuff. Actually, we have your one of your calculators and a few of your uh, reports on our website on propertybuyer.com.au. So you can jump on there and grab them. But uh, Tyron from uh, Washington Brown, thank you so much for sharing today. It's been wonderful. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to having you all back on the next edition of Property. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. 
If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help. Please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates, weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer podcast.